Anytime you're shortcutting it, you're probably cheating some people. Players play. Tough players win. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Center Podcast. For those of you joining us for the very first time ever, my I am your host, Anthony Ianni. I'm a former Michigan State basketball player as well as the first Division I college basketball player in NCAA history with autism. For those of you joining us for the first time, if you want to check out other episodes of the Center Podcast, you can check us out on Apple, Spotify, and odyssey.com. If you want to see today's video interview, you can subscribe to our YouTube page, which is the Center Podcast. First and foremost, again, you guys, Thank you so much for joining us. Hope you all are having an incredible summer. It's crazy to think that we're in August and school is going to start pretty soon. And my oldest son, Knox, shout out to Mike's son. He's going to be a first grader soon. Oh man, time flies when you're having fun, especially when it comes to having kids in life. So shout out to everybody who's going to start school soon. Enjoy your last weeks of the summer because they will go by like that. And college football will be on the horizon and here before we know it. But enough talk about summer and whatnot. We got an incredible, in my opinion, I talked to my producer, Will Gatson, about this. I think the lineup we got for the podcast this month is maybe one of our best, and it may not be top for a while. And we're excited to share it all with you guys. But today's guest on the podcast, to start us off on this incredible lineup we got this month, is, in my opinion, maybe one of the most humble individuals I've ever met in my life. And this is a young man who, from day one, has always played with confidence. He's worked his tail off. And any time that he put his mind to something, he kept going and going. And this is a young man who plays for the Memphis Grizzlies and is a former Michigan State great. And that's Xavier Tillman Sr. And having X on the show today has been awesome. And we got into a lot of different conversations. We talked about his high school days, his college days, his pro days. We had a lot of good stories. So a former Michigan State great, and now a Memphis Grizzly for the NBA. We get into our conversation with Xavier Tillman Sr. Enjoy, everybody. All right, so X, I'm just going to get right into it, man. And the re- one of the biggest reasons why I'm excited to have you on the Center Podcast is, and we kind of talked about for like a couple minutes there in the beginning, is you are probably one of the most, the nicest guys and most humble guys I've ever met in my entire life. And you, you just said it best. I think um, what we were saying, your aunt, your, your aunt was telling you how you got money now. You don't need to be humble or anything like that anymore. Mm-hmm. She was asking me. She just asked me, uh, my aunt Kia. She was like, yeah, man, like you got money now. Like, how do you stay so humble and down to earth? And my answer was simple. It was, you know, I, I still change poopy diapers. So this, you know, it's a, it's a humble moment every single time. You know, you think, you know, I made it. I'm too good for poopy diapers. Uh, it's your turn to change the baby. Okay. <laughs> and you, and you gotta take care of that. So, how are how your kids doing, man? How are they doing? Good, good. Yanni's four now. She's doing really oh. good. And uh, Xavier Jr., we call him Bubby. He's uh, he's doing well. He's one, almost one mm-hmm. and a half uh, next month. And they're doing good. Man, they, they're growing fast, man. I remember, I remember Yanni just being a little one when you first got to mm-hmm. the movie, man. And now she's four. That's crazy. Yeah. For real. She she always says, oh, my gosh, I miss Michigan State. I love Michigan State. I miss guys like <laughs> GB and Leak and Marmar. Da, da, da. And I'm like, you don't even really remember that time, do you? She's like, yeah, I do. I do. I do. I remember all the games and stuff. I'm like, okay. It's impressive. Those were special days, too, man. And, you know, before we get to your days in Michigan State, let's talk about your days growing up in Grand Rapids, man. Just kind of talk about, you know, what life was like growing up in Grand Rapids as a young kid. Uh, I had a good life. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, my parents, Tanya Powell May and Roosevelt Tillman, um, they grew up, I grew up with, uh, I feel terrible mixing stuff. I grew up with three older brothers and one younger sister. Um, so for me, I was the baby boy in the family. So me and my brothers always kind of fought for everything uh, between each other. Um, but it was great. Uh, we, we lived in like the Cascade area of Grand Rapids. So 
uh, it was a decently wealthy, yeah, wealthy area. So we were pretty taken care of in that aspect. So I always had this kind of bubble around me growing up to where um, I always thought people had money. Like, I just thought that's what it was. I didn't know at all until I got into the real world. So I was always in this positive mentality, always had a positive outlook on life. I never really saw my parents down or negative, you know, not until, you know, they got divorced and it was just with one another. But in terms of life and stuff like that, my parents always were these perfect role models and the fact that, you know, if stuff was hard, I, I never could tell on their face. I was always like, okay, like day in and day out, sick or not sick, I couldn't tell. They always kept me pushing. And that's something that um, as I got older, as I got my own kids, I started to realize, yeah, no, I, I definitely need to ad adopt this mentality because, you know, it's it's great to see when, when you know, you could be sick, but still want to fight through it. You could have a bad day, but still want to fight through to the next day. And you're not just caught up laying in bed and and drowsy and whatnot. So, um, yeah, great role models of my parents. Um, I started playing basketball probably when I was like three or five, you know, just in the backyard for a while. Got into YMCA. From, y from YMCA was the, this group called the Courthouse. And that was like, you know, just around the Midwest from Michigan, Indiana, and uh, Ohio, and Illinois, just around there for a little, for like maybe a couple of years. And then I really got on the scene and started playing for this team called The Storm. And that's when I kind of took off. We traveled the country. And then, uh, yeah, after that, I just really dedicated myself to basketball. And um, it worked pretty well for me. So was basketball like your only sport that you played growing up? Or did you try other sports when you were a little kid? I definitely tried every, not every sport, but like I call them the primary sports. I tried baseball, soccer. I played football until my sophomore year in high school. I tried, I, I tried a lot of different sports, but basketball was definitely the one where I saw, like, oh, I'm good at this. Like, I even tried wrestling. I wrestled in middle school, and I was like, ah. Yeah, I was like, ah. Because <laughs> my, my older brother, right above me, he is uh, a state champ. He was a state champ his senior okay. year. His, his junior year, he was runner-up, and his sophomore year, he made it to, like, I guess, like, the playoffs or the quarterfinals, something like that. So he was a primetime wrestler. So I'm like, oh, okay, bet. Like, if he got it, I have to have some of it, right? <laughs> no. I mean, I remember, I remember um, my seventh or eighth grade, I think it maybe might have been eighth grade. I was, I was doing another you know, wrestling thing. I was like, eight, no. I said, man, I'm nice. I'm hype. I'm, da -da -da. I'm, I'm nice. I'm thinking, oh, yeah, I probably wrestle in, in high school too. And um, we played against a school called Caledonia or low. I think it was Caledonia. And I got okay. pinned. And I got pinned. I'm one. I was one eighty at the time. I think I'm one eighty eighth grader. So I'm. I think I'm strong, right? Yeah. Nah. This this kid was <laughs> at the time. This kid was maybe like five, six inches shorter than me, but just he had it. Got me. We wrestling, wrestling. Flip me over. I'm breathing heavy. I'm trying to fight him. I'm like, yo, I'm so tired, and this kid is killing. Me. And then he pinned me, and I said, you know what? That's it. I don't want to do this anymore because I cannot give max effort. And get dominated like this and it just i felt so helpless <laughs> I was like, yeah i can't do this anymore so yeah i stopped wrestling after that so you kind of talked about and, and one of the thing with my guests in the past x that i've noticed is that every single one of them tried other sports you know it wasn't just one particular sport and i think that's the one thing i want especially my younger generation of guests who listen to know that hey it wasn't just about one sport like for me i was like you like it wasn't just basketball for me until probably my sophomore year of high school and it was the main focus after that. But like, I did, I did baseball, I did football, like I did soccer for a little bit. Like I did all these different things to kind of see, you know, where I kind of fit in and everything. But with you, you kind of talked about, you started playing ball when you were around three, four, five years old. And then when you got a little bit older, that's kind of when you knew, yeah, this is where my future's at. When did it kind of click to you that, Hey, you know, I want to play at the next level and I can't play at the next level. Like when did that kind of set in, uh, get in your mind for a little bit? I'm, I'm about to show you. I'm about to show you. Cause I just came from uh, at Michigan. Actually I had my first basketball camp and uh, okay. my mom, she keeps every bit of memorabilia and I've seen it and I was like, wow, you know what? I definitely got to bring this to my house now. Let me see. <laughs> let me see. I got to show you. Oh yeah. That, that would be important to me too. If I had that. Uh, let me grab this thing. Um, yep, right there. Okay. We got it laminated and everything. 
<laughs> it was like one of the first things. It was the first, um, I guess, newspaper article I ever had. Okay. Yeah. So let me, let me go back and sit down over here. But uh, I'm excited to see this. No, right. The picture's terrible though, because the picture is me getting flipped. <laughs> so you see, this is me. Yep. Yeah, and the kid underneath me, his name is CJ. He he took me out, <laughs> and really? I ended up flip, I ended up flipping on my back. But more of the story is, this is my very first article, and I got it this summer going into my freshman in high school. And mind okay. you, this is after an AAU tournament, so I didn't even know they did. You got you got in the newspaper for AAU tournaments, and yeah. um, we lost this tournament. We lost in the championship game. But I mean, I played, I did my own, I held my own for sure. I was dominating in the thing. We just lost as a team. And I remember after the game, this guy came up to me, I guess his name's on here, Dean Holes, Holesworth. And he was like, um, yeah, can I interview you? I'm like, interview me? We, we just lost the game. You want to interview me? And he was like, yeah, I want to interview you. I'm like, okay. And I remember I seen before the game, my varsity coach, uh, Ken George was up there. And I'm like, okay, this is sweet. And um yeah, no, after I got interviewed, I was like, oh, okay, no, this is serious. And then prior to that, like during some of my AU stuff like that, I was getting different college coaches that were coming to my game. So I kind of figured, okay, well, I'm getting slight interest from like Virginia Tech, Ohio State, uh, Dayton, and Michigan at the time. Yeah. So. So, that, so that article right there is kind of what really set the tone for you going forward. A bunch of confidence. I gained a bunch of confidence. I mean, I was already confident, but like this put it over the top. This is like uh, validation, I guess. Not validation, mm -hmm. but like confirmation. Like, okay, you're, you are as nice as you think you are. You're not just, you know, your head's just not just blown up. You're good enough to get in the newspaper. So like, okay, I, I can run with this. I'm not a newspaper for football or anything like that. And that wasn't until later on, like in high school, I got a newspaper for football, but I didn't want to run with that. So I had to put that, I had to put that down. <laughs> And as you well know, the Grand Rapids Press, man, it's a really big deal on the west side of the state of Michigan when you get in the Grand Rapids Press because people read that thing nonstop, like 24-7. Mm -hmm. That's why I got to laminate it. <laughs> I'm like, this is legit. <laughs> this is legit, for sure. So let's talk about your high school career a little bit. So you go, so you start off at Forest Hill Central, had a really good uh, freshman year. Then you went over to Grand Rapids Christian High School, and basically it's where it took off from there, man. I mean, your junior year was your was it your junior year when you went to the state finals, or was it your senior year? Senior year, senior year. My okay. sophomore and junior year, we lost in the same spot both years. Sophomore and junior, which was what round? The regional semi. So the first round, like right after we got one districts, we lost to Muskegon both times. We lost to Deontay Davis my sophomore year, and oh, then we that's just right. lost to. We lost to Muskegon, and they just had guys who could just go. Like, they were just hoopers yeah. killing us. So, I, forgot about, yeah. I forgot about Muskegon back in the day. I forgot about those teams. Tough, tough. <laughs> Man, that was my favorite. Those are my favorite matchups playing against Muskegon because I always knew I had to bring my best or they were going to blow me up. Yeah. And, and and you know that even to, even today, like currently in your days, like, you know, you don't want to get embarrassed, so you got to bring your, your A game against the best. And that, that's how I was in high school. We were, we were playing, I don't know if this name uh, rings a bell for you or not, but we played Holt High School, which was our biggest rivalry. And Paul Crosby, I don't know if you met Paul or not, I've ever heard of Paul. But Paul was 6'7", 270 in high school. And he played hey. center, yeah, both center and power forward. So I was 6'9 and a half, like 215. And here I am, he's got like, yeah, he's 50 pounds heavier than me. <laughs> But every game, every game we played against each other, it's like we both brought our A games every time we played against each other. Because I knew I was not going to get embarrassed by him. He didn't want to get embarrassed by a skinny guy like me at the time. So we just mm -hmm. went after and after it. And, like, games like that, man, I think is what makes the great players thrive the most, is that when you have that certain rivalry, you know, whether in, in any sport, whether it's football, basketball, you know, soccer, baseball, whatever, that – for whatever reason, that rivalry against that individual or that team just makes you get up each and every single time. It makes you go to a different level that you've never been to before. Mm -hmm. it's, it's funny you say that. It makes you go to a level that you've never been to, but you have this confidence that you can tap into. Yeah. It. Like you, you're like, you know what? I don't know what I'm capable of as far as like my best, but I know I'm going to bring my best against you. Whatever right. that is, you're about to see my best. Right. 
And so, and, and you did that in high school, man. I mean, your junior year, you averaged a double double, 16 points, 10, 10 boards a game, throwing three assists, shot over 60% from the field, which is extremely good. And then senior year, 14 points, 11 rebounds, five assists, four blocks. You know, you got to the state championship game, a finalist for Mr. Basketball. You were all state and everything. When you look back on your high school career and everything that you learned from your varsity coach at Grand Rapids Christian, is there anything that you look back on and go, man, I wish I would have done this differently or man, I wish I had done this in this game and we could have won it all. Like do you ever have those thoughts at all or, or you have that mindset of, you know what, oh, I did what I did and I'm just going to keep moving forward. I mean, obviously I don't, I don't dwell on this at all because of my life now. <laughs> I don't dwell on it, but <laughs> I definitely, uh, definitely things that I wish I could have changed. Like I wish I was more aggressive. Like, I hear stories of my my NBA or, or college teammates. They're like, "Oh yeah, man, I averaged like twenty five in high school." I'm like, "Dang, twenty five. And I was just one of those guys who I was aggressive against the good teams, but against the bad teams, I was like, "Yo, like everybody eats, bro. Like we're not like, we're not losing this game. So I, why 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 go for thirty? I can just you know get everybody happy and da da da." So my senior year, how my stats went down to fourteen. I had this guy on my team now who's going to the draft, Dwayne Washington. Yep. And he was he was like a killer like in the in the process though like he wasn't all the way a killer but like he was showing glimpses where this dude can right. go so i'm like yo like like you got it go ahead you got it when you need me i'm here but you got it and and kind of passing the keys off like that and he kind of ran with it for you know a lot of uh my, my senior year for sure me me him james beck seth milner uh us four we just kind of just here it's your night you go ahead it's your night you go ahead type vibe you guys had a squad your senior year, man. Four Division One, four Division One, and then we had um, Thad Shemansky who played at Calvin, as well as uh, Emmett Warner who played at Calvin. We had guys who played college ball after yeah. they got done. So we had like six. Yeah, there was that six guys who played college basketball on a high school team. That's ridiculous. Yeah, four D one, and then I think Calvin maybe D three. Yeah, the, Cal Calvin and Hope, in my opinion, they are not only a, an intense rivalry, but in my opinion, maybe some of the top Division three programs in the country when it comes mm -hmm. to basketball. And that's on the west side of the state in Grand Rapids. Like that's no, it's big time. It's basketball. big time. There's no slouch. Like, oh, nobody's like, oh man, I got offered by Calvin. No, man, you got offered by Calvin. Like that's like the starters like, package. I call it. Once you get the Calvin offer, you're like, okay, you know what? I can, mm -hmm. I can up in there for sure. And I've, I've told recruits too this, man. Like, you know, I, I, I went to Grand Valley State for two years on a full ride. Coach is in Michigan State offered me a walk on spot and said, you know, you could get a scholarship down the road if one's available. But I took the Division II offer because it's, it's free school, everything is paid for. And when I hear recruits say to me, well, I'm D1 or bust, I'm like, dude. <laughs> You get a D3 offer to one of the greatest Division three programs in the country, I don't care whatever sport it is, and it's free school, you take it. because Listen, we they don't know. They Listen, they're not the ones, well, obviously they could be the ones that they got to take the loan out for, it, but they don't think like, oh, if I don't get a scholarship, I have to, I have to pay for it. They just think, oh, if I don't go to Michigan State or Michigan, man, I'm terrible. That's no, it. No, you have a no. free education. Your parents are so geeked that they mm -hmm. did not have to pay for your college education. So exactly. you're doing them a favor. Exactly. And like my dad's always taught me, like we we were, my freshman year, we were 36 and one at Grand Valley State. We were 30 and 0 the regular season. We beat Michigan State, which, you know, that's a story for a different time for you and me. Yeah, we beat Michigan State my freshman year at the Brez. And Whoa. so I have a funny Coach Izzo story to tell you later um, regarding that. But we won a couple, we won a league championship and we got to the elite eight and that was part of our, it was on our championship ring. And my dad, and I'll never forget this. And I tell this to recruits, it doesn't matter if you're D1, D2, D3, NAIA, whatever, a championship's a championship and nobody can take that away from you. And you get your banner it hung up in that gym where you played at. And that's something I, I'll never forget. And that's something I always tell our, my high school kids that I coach. That's something I tell recruits all the time is that it doesn't matter where you go. Championship's a championship. And nobody's nobody's ever going to take that away from you. No. Absolutely. So speaking of recruiting, let's talk about um, your recruiting uh, days a little bit. So 
you talked a little bit earlier about how, about how you had a lot of teams looking at you. When did Michigan State come in the conversation for you? Sophomore year. I got, I got, I, got, I, I guess maybe my freshman year, I had been visiting a little bit and, and, um, and doing stuff like that, going to open gyms. But sophomore year, I remember walking with Coach Izzo after one of the football games. And I had to figure that it was the day I was going to get off for it. But um, I just remember, like, he walked up to me and said, hey, man, you have a spot here on the team. And he winked at me. And I said, hmm. Like, I, was like, <laughs> I was like, does that mean I have a scholarship? Because, like, in my head, I'm like, I think that means you're in. But at the same time, like, no, I need to hear this guy say I have a scholarship. So then I asked him then and there. The coach, are you saying I have a scholarship? I said, yeah. What do you want me to write it out for you? <laughs> I started crying. I started crying, laughing. Like, no, 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 you're good. I'm sorry. All right, thanks. <laughs> oh, that's a typical coach is a response too. Mm-hmm. Write it down for you, like, <laughs> right? Because think about it. Like, I'm like, okay, he says I'm in, but if I go tell other people that he said I'm in, and and he winked at me, other people go like, bro, that's just a wink, and he says he likes you. That doesn't mean that you got off. I need to hear him say, no, he said I have. Scholarship. Oh man, kind of talk about that feeling that you get a full ride offer from what, as we both know, one of the better basketball programs in the state of Michigan. Talk about that feeling. Um, that was unbelievable. And it was unbelievable. It was also mainly because of his uh, status and how mm-hmm. like he's one of a Hall of Fame coach. So it's like, okay, if he thinks you're good enough to play at his program, and he sent numerous cats to go play in the league you have a chance. He sees that you have a chance to make it. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, man. It was even more motivation to, to keep working until I got there because I knew, like, once I get there, I'll have four years, and he's just going to mold me into this beast where I can, you know, one day play at the next level. And 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 based on the track record that he has, he's still, he's still going to continue to do that, too. And I think – one of the biggest comparisons that when I saw you, when I saw early film on you in high school, I compared you to, to Day Day a little bit, Draymond Green, because your guys' game was almost exactly the same. You know, Day Day was coming in, you know, at a heavier weight. You were kind of the same deal at that time. And I remember telling people, I said, you know what? I said, this kid has a chance to not only be like, be like Day Day, but maybe be a little bit better than him in certain as in certain uh, parts of the game, and so so what was kind of the big reason you took Michigan State over Marquette and Purdue? Um, I just I was so comfortable. I had been there, I had been there for so many years, just on business and stuff like that. I remember I, I was I was this I mean I was this close to committed to Marquette in the summertime because. Me and uh, DJ were like beefing a little bit, like during my recruiting process, because he came to one of my games in high school. And he said, "Listen, man, like you stop working out or what? Like you got to get in the gym." And mind you, I hadn't stopped working out. It's just the game that he went to. I wasn't aggressive. I only had like right. five points, but we won by forty. I'm mm-hmm. like, "What are you talking about? Like I'm not good enough. We won by forty. Like that wasn't even." And so, like he's like, "Yeah, he stopped working." I'm like, "Man, no, nah, that's bull. Like I literally go work out every morning." <laughs> so for him to say that. Like, I'm not messing with him, da, da, da. even though he's being bluntly honest. Like, I'm supposed to be able to look on the court and just tell, oh, that's the guy going to Michigan State. I'm not supposed to be searching for the guy who's going to Michigan State. So he told me that. I'm like, yeah, I'm cool on you guys. And going into my senior year summer, me and the coach at the time, assistant coach Stan Johnson at Marquette, was just texting, calling back and forth, telling me I'm going to be the cornerstone of the university when it's Marcus Howard. But at the time, I don't know if he was even there. So I was like, okay bet this is gonna be perfect da, 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 da. I, I get to basically have a whole university behind my back and oh i got a cramp oh, i got a cramp Uh-oh. Like, oh. charles buckley oh. Oh. <laughs> I got a cramp. yes i got a charlie horse anyway <laughs> they said um okay it's going to waste jesus that was crazy <laughs> um basically i was going to be the man on this i thought like, okay bet and then we went on the official visits and the vibe of the team, the vibe of the coaching staff with their like spouses and stuff like that. Um, I just wasn't, I wasn't feeling it. I was like, ah, that's not really what I thought. And Marquette's in Milwaukee. So it's like, it's like a city vibe. It's not like really like a university, like Michigan state, you go to Lansing, you know, it's, it's Lansing, but you go like when it's, when you're like in Michigan state, it feels like everything that you dreamed about a university, as far as like, 
the campus vibe, you know, um, all the all the kids, the, the the community that's there, the fan base, like everything. Like it feels like everything that you would see like in a movie. So I was like, you know what, this is perfect. And then obviously the perks of having a coach like Coach Izzo, I knew that I was gonna be successful making that choice for sure. And you definitely were, man. And and before we get into your days in Michigan State, there was an event that took place early on in your life that probably changed maybe the way you think a little bit and maybe how you take life now. And that was the birth of your daughter. I mm-hmm. think, how, how, old when, uh, how old were you when Yanni was born? 17, 18? 17. Okay. So just talk about that a little bit. And obviously, you know, you and I are both fathers. You know, I got two boys, a six-year-old and a three-year-old, which my six-year-old is shooting on a 10-foot rim, by the way, with a men's ball. So tell tell the Grizzlies to be on the lookout for Knox Ianni in about 15 years, bro. All right. Oh, but, um, but I always tell people, man, that the greatest, the two of the greatest days in my life are the day I got married and the day I had my kids. Mm-hmm. So would you agree that those are two of the best days in your life? And then the day when both your kids were born? Absolutely. I mean, if you think about it, that's a piece of you entering the world and it's your sole responsibility to mm-hmm. mold this person, to be a good person in the world, yeah. to be a, a plus to society like it's literally all news like if he doesn't make it as far as like he treats people wrong he ends up in jail he's abusive and stuff like that they're gonna look at the father like yo what were you doing right so it's literally on you to to mold them to be the right person to to handle people the right way and all that good stuff so like i was excited i was excited for the opportunity i was excited for the challenge of being a father and i was because of my dad i knew that i was going to be a I wasn't going to be an absent father because my dad was always in my life. So I knew like, okay, bet. Like, I know how to do this. I just have to be there, be present, be loving, be caring, and everything else will fall into place. What was, was there anything in your life that you changed right away after Yanni was born? Uh, definitely. I had to lock in on my relationship with Tamia at the time. I'm, I'm a high schooler, you know, high school boys trying to act like high school boys. I definitely mm-hmm. had to focus in like, hey, you you have now, at the time she wasn't my fiance, but um, you have a girlfriend and a, and a daughter now. You can't just be out here like the rest of your high school friends. You have to focus and you have to lock in on that. So I think that was a, a big adjustment for me. And it was definitely, um, it was a lot easier than I thought whenever I put my mindset to, I'm a father and this is what fathers do and they handle their business. And you definitely, and that was a little bit of extra motivation for you, I'm guessing too, because now you got, now you got, you're now wife, girlfriend at the time in your corner. And now you got Yanni, your youngest daughter, or your oldest, I should say, excuse me, watching watching you now every day. That had to be an even more motivating for you when you stepped foot on campus at Michigan State. Absolutely. And and it was easy for me not to get distracted with, you know, everything that a college campus has to offer. Because it's like, yo, you got to go home. You got to go spend time with your child. You got to go spend time. You got to feed them um you gotta you know entertain them until they go to bed you gotta put them to bed bathe them all that stuff so i was like okay i don't have time to go to these parties i don't have time to obviously i made time for sure to go to movies and stuff with my team and and go out to eat i even brought yanni to those events because uh, my teammates love yanni and it took a load off on tamia where she could take a break so um i definitely it allowed me to focus more for sure like school basketball family that was literally my like triangle and that's all i focused on when I was at Michigan State. I love it, man. So let's talk about your days at Michigan State. So your freshman year, you know, was there ever a thought in your mind that, hey, look at the team we got. We got we got Josh Langford, we got Cash, Miles, Jaron, Nick Ward. Was there ever a thought in your mind that said, hey, I'm gonna be a freshman and we're gonna win a national championship this year? Like with the with the with the team we got, with the stack, you know, roster we got. What's going to stop us this year? Like, was that, did that ever cross your mind as uh, like your freshman year? We were number one. <laughs> we were oh, number, I forgot I about that. Was, <laughs> I think it was only for a hot minute though. Like every time I've been number one, I always lost like the next, like, <laughs> like the next game. <laughs> like, we didn't hold it long, but we started the season off. I think we're ranked number one. So I was like, oh snap. Like we are, we're considered to be national champions. We're going to do it. And it, I mean, it didn't last long to where we were number one but having a record of 30 and five and beating the good teams pretty good I, I i felt confident for sure i'll kind of talk about a little bit toward the end of the season where you know 
you took some bumps toward the end where you, you lost to Michigan in the Big Ten tournament, and then you're able to kind of get home court advantage in the NCAA tournament. You lose to a Syracuse team, but in those games, you were starting to come on a lot, quite a bit. You were rebounding the ball a lot. You were being aggressive. You were kind of giving Michigan State fans a glimpse of what the future of Xavier Tillman was going to look like. But losing that Syracuse game, was that maybe one of the toughest games that you look back on and go, man, like, like how the heck did we lose this game? Like, was it one of the toughest losses you've ever taken in your career? Yes, for sure. Um, just because we had been so touted to at least, at least go to like the elite eight. Yeah. So I, I was, I was, Oh, okay. Like, this is fine. Like, we'll just play this game against Syracuse, handle business, go on to the next round and kind of look past them. Uh, we know we practice for them and whatnot, but it was like, yo, like, don't worry about it. We're going to do what we're going to do. Miles is going to drop, you know, high twenties. Josh is going to average. He's going to have high teens. Nick's going to have high teens. Cash is going to score when he's got his opportunities from three. We'll be good. And then obviously Jaron. Jaron is going to do what Jaron does. But, you know, just that just wasn't in the cards. I think we made four out of 43 or something like that. We shot an mm-hmm. absurd amount of three-pointers. And and we missed all of them. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. we missed all of them. And so, like, when the, when, the, when the season ended, I was like, man, I can't believe we just lost. And then just because the person I am, I looked at the stats as far as like, what could I have done to do better? And I seen, like, okay, yeah, you had a career rebounding. I think I had like 13 or 14 yeah. boards, but I only had five points. And I think I shot it three times like that because I was nervous. I was like, ah, I don't want to shoot. Like I'm not skilled enough yet to, to be at this level scoring like that. So I was like, ah, I'm not going to do that. So I literally took it personal going into the next off season. Uh, I guess my, my, yeah, my second off season to where like, I'm like, I'm going to dedicate myself to this three-point line. I'm going to dedicate myself to learning how to score different ways so that when my opportunity is called again this next year, I'll be ready to go. And I got my opportunities and I was ready to go. And your focus, man, like that entire offseason, it showed too because look at the weight loss and the hard training that you went through. Man, I I remember somebody took um, a photo of you your freshman year and then showed it. I think it might have been on the journey where they showed like your freshman year when you came in at 270 and then here you are at 245. And I was like, it's like, geez, I'm like, this guy could go in the UFC and probably fight tomorrow. I mean, goodness. <laughs> like, so what did you do as far as like, you know, your diet and your workout routines? Like, what did you change up between your freshman year leading up to that offseason? Like, what did you change? Different? Like, what was different? Um, a couple of things. One thing, though, that really stuck out is I got sick. Uh, that's that's some I got sick for about a week and I didn't eat like almost for a week straight like I just I couldn't eat anything I had one of those like colds that you get from your kids uh you know when they're just at daycare and they just pick up different stuff like this I was out for a week and I didn't and I did not eat and I remember I came back in the in the like high 40s low 50s and they're like oh man are you all right and I said I feel very lightheaded but I'll be good and then do extremely hard workouts and then me just not eating McDonald's, Burger King, uh, what else? McDonald's, Burger King, Taco Bell. Uh, Wendy, Wendy's. I don't, I never really messed with Taco Bell like that. I, no. heard a bad, I heard a bad story about them growing up. So I didn't really mess with Taco Bell. But like the, the main fast food joints, I stayed yeah. away from. I really stayed away from. I went to more like Panera's, uh, mm-hmm. Blaze Pizza, that's right down the street in, in EL, was a go-to for me just because like, I could put veggies on it and stuff like yep. that. Um, and then, yeah, I just avoided it. And then I ate a lot of team meals and stuff that they had and chose better options. Like they, like Marshall rep really helped me choose better options instead of just, you know, like eating whatever, getting three pieces of chicken, mashed potatoes and gravy. It was like, no, nah, I get two pieces of chicken because you need that. But let's get some veggies on it and, and all that good stuff. So they did a good job at state too, just, him and, and Emily, who was our nutritionist at the time, they both just helped me. Like, hey, yeah, take some of this. Don't take none of that. Take some of this. Take some of that. And then I just the routine became a habit, and I ran with it. And then obviously the training regimen. You go hard at Michigan State. It's just what it oh, is. Yeah. So, so in the summertime, every day, Monday through Friday, we're just killing it in, in the weight room. We're killing it in the gym. So the, that losing the fat, I think I was like five, six percent body fat at the time. Wow. Like I was, I was shredded 
and it was just because we went so hard. They helped me like choose the, the right stuff to eat, and you know, it was good. Like I said, man, you could have went to the UFC the next night and fought somebody and probably won that fight easily. <laughs> nah, I still gotta have some skill. I, I really can't be fighting like that. I don't really, I didn't get in a lot of fights growing up. I'm big though, so I could tackle somebody, you know, put them in a oh, little there we go. or something. But there you, you go. want me to you want me to box. I I gotta get some footwork together. <laughs> well, let's talk about your sophomore year, man. And that was you know, I kind of like to say it was an interesting year, but it was a fun year because early on in the season, you know, a lot of people had questions about how that team was going to be. You know, you were losing two lottery picks in Jaron and Miles. And people asked me like, hey, AI, how do you think the team's going to be this year? And I always kept telling people, I said, you know what? This will be one of Coach Is's best teams. And, and here's why I said that. Because in my opinion, Coach Izzo does his best coaching when he's coaching guys who aren't like lottery picks or like superstars, like his best is when he's coaching guys who are two, three or four year guys. I mean, mm -hmm. you and cash are good examples. You were three, four year guys and you turn into studs. Um, you know, it, it's nothing against Jaron and, and miles. Cause Jaron and miles, I mean, we all knew Jaron was a top 10 pick top five pick when he first got to Michigan state. But I've always thought like coach is his best coaching days are when he's coaching guys who are underdogs when people doubt him or his or his players and guys who had just been around the program the longest. And mm -hmm. I told people, I said, you watch out. I said, we're going to surprise a lot of people. And not only did we surprise a lot of people, man, I mean, that, I mean, you won another big 10 championship. You won a big 10 tournament title. The first one since 2014, you went to a final four, which we'll get into in a little bit, but that season, you know, Nick Ward hurts his hand and you were the sixth guy coming off the bench and you were doing your thing you know, coming off the bench. I mean, you were Big Ten six man of the year that year. But when Nick Ward gets hurt, and I think you and I have had this discussion a couple times in the past. When Nick got hurt, did it immediately go into your mind of, all right, I don't know how long Nick's going to be out for. He's going to try and go back as soon as he can. But for now, I got to hold down the front. I got to make sure that I'm out here doing what I got to do. And basically, if Nick comes back, I'm not giving up that spot because it's my spot now. Did, did that ever enter your mind at all? Uh, it was two parts that entered my mind. The first one um, was, oh, snap. That's 20 <laughs> points a game, 10 rebounds a game. Yeah. Where are we going to get that? I'm right. already at the – well, no, I wasn't. I was going to say I was already averaging 10. I was probably averaging like maybe like six and six at the time. So I'm already averaging six and six, feeling myself because my freshman year, I was averaging like two and two. So I'm like, you doing mm -hmm. way better the freshman year. So good job. Right. Had myself on the back. And I remember having this talk with uh, DJ. We we're warming up for practice. And he told me, he asked me, he's like, are you renting or buying? I said, what the heck does that mean? He was like, well, if you're renting, that means when Nick gets back, you know, you're going to keep the seat warm for him. You know what I'm saying? Get the, get the car ready for him. And when it gets back, you can say, here you go. Or are you buying? When And the fact that, you know, you're taking this spot. You're not going to let him get this spot back. And, you know, because of DJ, I said, no, I'm buying, I'm buying, I'm buying. I didn't have to believe it at the time. I just, you know, I'm saying it with conversation. You can't right. be, you know, quote unquote soft when you're talking to DJ. Like, you got to, you know, believe everything you say. You got to be that, um, that macho man. But so at the time he, I said it, I'm buying. I didn't believe it, but I, I knew that I had the guys around me that could help me flourish. Because I didn't do the things. Like, I was successful, but I wasn't successful in the way that Nick was successful. But you right. could give Nick the ball and get out the way, and he was going to yeah. handle his. You couldn't do that to me at the time. I'd catch it, look at everybody, throw the ball back out, go to the ball screen. <laughs> so, for me, it was the ball screen. And then on defense, it was the, the ability to be able to switch on a lot of ball screens. Because then we put a lot of pressure on other teams when they would attack, you know, guys like Nick who couldn't guard or, at the time, Marcus was a freshman. Guys like that, they would attack him because they're like, oh, yeah, they can't stay in front. But me, I'm 240, lean cut, 5 6% mm -hmm. body fat. I can move my feet now. So now, you know, we switch a ball screen. Guys like Xavier Simpson attacking me. I'm going to slide my feet, slide my yeah. feet, block the shots. The whole world is like, yo, this dude can guard. And he sets good screen and gets the cash open or, or McQuaid open for threes. Like, he's a good piece for them. And that was kind of what I wanted to be. I didn't want to be this flashy guy doing all this stuff because we had people for that. Like Cash was the man. His junior year, my sophomore year, Cash was the man. So I said, listen, whatever I could do to get us wins, let me do it. And that was setting screens, finishing lobs, 
uh, hitting threes when I got opportunities and, and locking up on D. And I just ran with that. Just doing the little things. That's all you were doing. Mm -hmm. The little things and, and running with it and, and being happy doing the little things. That wasn't like, oh, man, like, I want my shot. Like, why does the coach want me play? It was like, nah, you do your job. You play your role. And sooner or later, your, your opportunity is going to come where coach is like, hey, I'm going to place for you now. So make mm -hmm. sure you're ready. And that's the thing, too, especially with younger generation of players, especially at the high school level. Like, there are some kids out there that want to be the big stud, that want to be the five-star player, the big man on campus at their school, whereas they don't focus on, like you said, doing the little things, like setting the ball screens and rolling so your teammates can get the ball to you, or it's a wide open three for your point guard. Um, switching ball screens on defense and playing point guards. Like like you said, you're 6'8", six, 6'9", and you're guarding Xavier Simpson out there, who's one of the quickest dudes in the Big Ten, and you're having no problem guarding him. Whereas mm -hmm. everybody wants to be the big man on campus in, at high school instead of focusing on the little things and knowing their role. And I think, in my opinion, man, and I'm not just saying this, you know, because you know, because I know you, you were one of my guys, but you knew you played your role so well that I think the entire team saw that, and everybody then started playing their role. Like, they knew what they were going to do. They knew what they had to do in order to win. And I think, in my opinion, man, you kind of set that tone a little bit for 2019. Yeah. Um, I think especially because my – me, like, getting better, too. So, guys are seeing, like, no, X is playing out of his mind. But he's still, like – he's X. He's, he's humble about it. He's not, yeah. like, you know, acting out. Now he's, he's not, like, going out now and, and saying, no, nah, man, look at me. Look at me. He's still holding his own, joking around with the fellas. Like he's, he's still X. And I'm like, yeah, like, yes, I'm, I'm getting better, getting more notoriety, but I want to win. That's more important than notoriety. Like I want to win. I want to be known as a winner. And I, I having that mentality, like you said, it helped my teammates buy it even more. Guys like Aaron Henry, who came in, nobody knew who he was, but everybody on our team was like, yo, Aaron is low key the most talented player on the team. His freshman year, <laughs> we we're like, he's the most talented. But uh, we didn't know how we were going to be able to, like, reel him in. And just seeing – just for him seeing everybody work on a day-to-day -day basis and how locked in we were and how focused we were and not big-headed, he was like, okay, I see. I, I can do that too. And it all fell into, into the right pieces. Real quick, uh, quickly before we talk about the Final Four, the senior night against Michigan, so Cueto and Kenny's senior night, was that the loudest and the craziest – game that you've been a part of at the Breslin Center in your career? Was that the, was that like the number one craziest, loudest game ever? That I won, yeah. I've had some loud games at Purdue where I got beat by 30 and it was just <laughs> rock, it was rocking the whole night. And I was like, man, like on my birthday, that was, a, it was, it was a, on my birthday, we got beat by 30 at Purdue and the whole joint was rocking the whole time. And I was like, man, what a 21st birthday. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> definitely, Definitely my sophomore year, that game was, was the most uh, rocking. I felt like Michigan State crowd had ever been in my career. And on top of that, though, I even was playing bad. I remember at the beginning of the game or even in the first half. And I remember Coach coming to the locker room, grabbed DJ. It was like, that's your guy, right? What's he doing? <laughs> and, and we're down. We're probably losing by like eight or so. I'm not stressed about it because – our, our name is our team name at the time was the Heartbreak Kids. So what we do was, you know, we let teams get their confidence, but we always like do we that. come back. We come back with a vengeance and we break hearts. That's just what we did. Okay. So I was like, no, I'm cool and calm and collected in the locker room. Just you know, drink more water like this. And we good. Everybody's like, yeah, we good, we good. Quite like, come on. I'm like, I got you, we good. Coach comes in, we're not good. <laughs> look at the score. <laughs> I'm like, coach, I know the score. We down eight, but listen. We can go on a run, and I know it. I can feel it. We can go on a run, and then we all go, say, yeah, right. <laughs> he said, well, you better. And I'm laughing. I'm laughing. Now I'm not laughing, but I'm like, yo, it's like, come on, chill. Like, bro, like we, we got, got it, it. man. <laughs> and, and, and Cass like, oh, yeah, you're right. We got it. We bring it in. We break out. And then the rest is history. If you see, you know, um, if you watch the rest of the second half of the game, we were flowing. I was flowing. Cass mm -hmm. was flowing. Quaido was getting buckets. You know, Henny was getting buckets too. Like everybody was just playing the role the right way, and 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 we ended up winning that game. One one play I remember very well from that game. I think it was coming out of a timeout. Um, we were you guys were up at the time. You and Cash were doing a high screen pick and roll, 
and Cash comes off it and you roll. He throws a lob to you. And I was like, oh, man, X is like one step in front of the free throw line. Like, I don't know if he's going to get to that ball. I swear, you jumped so high out of the gym. You caught that ball and you just threw it in. And my buddy, my old roommate uh, from Grand Valley State, Mike Prisdale, who had never been to a Michigan State game with the Brez, that was his first game ever. And he was that game was his first game? That was his first game ever. And he was like, dude, you couldn't have brought me to the Breslin Center at a perfect time. So after you that, after you dunked that ball, he looked at me and he was like, Did you see where he took off from? I'm like, Yeah, I knew. I saw. And that that play to me, I was like, Yep, it's our night. We're 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 gonna have some fun tonight. And you guys did. But speaking of fun, man, that final four run, I've seen a lot of Michigan State teams. You know, I was part of a Final Four run my first year back in Michigan State. But I think as far as your guys' run goes, that had to be the most intense, nerve-wracking, and fun ride mm-hmm. when it came to Michigan State Final Fours. Because, you know, the Bradley game was nerve-wracking. You know, I, I, I could tell that you guys just wanted to get through that game because of what happened with Middle Tennessee State a couple of years ago. Second round, you play Minnesota. It's like, all right, it's Big Ten all over again. We got this. Mm -hmm. You guys were just clicking on all all cylinders. And then came the game against basically a Duke team that everybody had said, yeah, they're not going to lose to anybody because they got Zion. You know, they got all these freshmen. They're not going to lose. But what you remember what I told you the night the night before that game? Mm -hmm. I said you go out and you put your footprint. And this, you put your footprint in our program and show the entire world why Michigan State basketball is who we are. And then I said, P.S., I want a monster dunk in that game. And then I got, I, not only did I get the first one from you, but I got the second one when you threw down that dunk toward the end, like toward the end of the game, I was like, yep, they know what they're doing. But yeah, I, I asked Kenny this question. I want to ask you, and, and of course you play against him now in the league today. Talk about playing against Zion a little bit, because at that time, Zion was, it was everybody in college basketball, and then there's Zion, because the spotlight was on him. What was it like playing against him for the first time that year? Um, Great. That dude is the ultimate competitor. And for being on the spotlight, he did not shy away at all. And I, I don't know how long he's been in the spotlight, but, like, you could tell, like, he was ready for the moment. It wasn't like, oh man, like we're in the Elite Eight now. Let, let's see what's happening. He was like, nah, man, like let's hoop, let's go. And for me, my biggest thing was I'm not gonna let him punk me. Uh, especially because me and me and Nick were joking around the night before we were watching film on him. And Nick played that game. He he didn't start, but he played that game. And he was like, um, yo, man, like that's your matchup. Because we, we were talking about either it was gonna be Kenny on him or me on him. And I was like, no, I'm like, yeah, I got him. Da, da, da. And Nick was like, man, you nervous? I said, man, I'm not nervous. But let me tell you, I was probably watching film by myself for two and a half hours. Like then after our film session broke on the whole team, I went back and watched two and a half hours of film myself just to see like, okay, I need to like learn this guy's tendencies. Cause the worst thing that I could do is like, let say he likes to go left just always go with all his hesitations to the right and he's dunking 10 times out of 10 then he's got the crowd his team's confident i'm like you got to know what he does and then after watching film i'm like this guy i think at the time he drove he drove left a ton i'm like this guy drives left all all the time and he does right-handed so i didn't know how that worked but that's just what he did so i remember guarding him and every time he had the ball in his right hand i said He's either going to, he's, he's got to cross over and go left. And if he doesn't cross over, he's just going to beat me going right. But I, in my head, I'm like, I watched the film. He's going left. And sure enough, he went left. He had the ball in his right hand. He always does this. He'll look over like at the wing and then he'll cross over and try to get you. And he was looking over and I was sitting there like, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. And he drove, put my body in, no fouling. He kept, he, I think I had like two, three turnovers on him where he just hit me, lost the ball out of bounds. And I was like, yeah, okay, like that film, that film really helped. <laughs> but no, nah, he was definitely the ultimate competitor. And then playing against him in the NBA, he got even more athletic. He got even faster. He's smarter now, knows like like angles and stuff like that. And when he gets his angle, it's a wrap. Like you can't even like back then, I well, I really couldn't contest back then if he blew past me, but like in the NBA, you can't let him get an angle. Otherwise, it's two points every time. 
the one thing I was always amazed with him and, and Kenny Goins and I had, had the same conversation. Every time he got the ball, whether it was on a rebound, he would just go right back up and dunk it. Whereas most guys, you know, would just get the ball and lay it back in. He would get gather and go up and just flush it. And I'm like, you're not supposed to do that. Like mm-hmm. most college kids, especially at his age at that time, you're not supposed to do that. Like I just see college kids get the rebound laid in. Like, no, he got it, went up and either dunked the two hands or just cocked it back one hand and flushed. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like, like he, in my opinion, he's probably the most athletic guy that I've ever seen come through college basketball in a long time. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. Wholeheartedly. And and along with what you're saying, you're not supposed to be able to like get a rebound. Like you're jumping for a rebound. You're not supposed to be able to jump as high as you can, grab the rebound, and then jump again and be yes. able to touch the ball on your back and then like not like drop it in, like slam it. Flush it, yes. And and I was like, I just was always like scratching my head, like this, this doesn't make sense. Cause he weighs <laughs> 300 pounds. Yeah. He's six, he's six five, 300 pounds with a 50 inch vertical <laughs> like that doesn't that just doesn't correlate ridiculous man just ridiculous ah oh. so at the end there you you took the ball out of bounds and i saw you do this to Cassius. Mm-hmm. i was like he's going long with this and duke doesn't see it and cash fakes to his face to his left and boop, he's gone right when you threw that ball in and you looked up to that clock that feeling of I just we just put ourselves in the history books of Michigan State. Talk about when that buzzer went off, the arena goes nuts of Spartan fans. And not only did you get to a final four, but you beat a Duke team that was considered the quote unquote most unstoppable college basketball team of all time. Just talk about that feeling, man, and how great that must have felt. Uh, in my head, I kept thinking, we beat the Gladiators. <laughs> <laughs> I was so hyped because I, I knew it. Like, after the game was over, I'm like, we just beat the team. Like, the team. Like, loaded. I'm talking Zion, RJ, Cam, Ty- or Trey Jones. Like, this team was loaded. So, we're like, Stacked. okay. We're like, to even compete with them is one thing. But now we beat them. We not even just beat them in regular season. We ended their college careers because these guys not coming back for another year no, except Trey, who had he had just one year after that but this guy's not coming back we literally finished their career whenever i describe like beating zion i'm like oh it's always nice to say like i ended his college career like i always get a chance <laughs> to say that obviously that's like come on man like like we're all doing bigger better things now but i'm like no you know how great of a player you are and for me to be able to say that like it's a good feeling yeah. it's like i got i got bragging rights for life man sorry for life <laughs> For life, for life. All right, man, I got a couple more questions for you, and then we'll get into the fun part of the podcast. So your senior year, man, you know, that that was, again, another interesting year. You were second team all Big Ten. Junior year. Junior, you were? Okay, my my, my apologies. Your senior year, though, you were defensive player of the year, and it showed with how you played defense, how you played against Luca Garza and all those guys. It really showed. And then you guys were basically playing your best basketball at a time when, you know, the tournament was about to start. And everybody, including me, was saying, all right, this team is starting to gel. They got it together now. They're going to be a force in the tournament. Watch out. But then the most interesting event in our lives happens. COVID-19 hits. The pandemic hits. Coach Is comes in and tells you guys, Season's over. As a junior at the time, and your draft stock is going up, you have decisions to make, obviously, but just what was the feeling in that gym like after that, where you guys are on top of the world, you're clicking as a team, and then all of a sudden, boom, it's just taken away from you like that? Um, Kind of like, you know, whenever you watch those NCAA best moments and they show the team that hits the buzzer beater, and then they ah. pants the losing team. I felt like the losing team. Like I was just mm-hmm. sitting there with my hands on my head, like, oh my God, like I can't believe this. And, I, and the reason I felt that way is because I felt like we had a legit chance to win. Like I was like, oh, like we're we won five games in a row, which I yep. think had been had might have been the most that we had won in a row the whole year. And it was at the right time, it was right before the season ended. So I was like, this is perfect. Like Malik was playing out of his mind. So now we had our four men because the whole year we've been battling in between Malik, right. Tommy, and Marcus. Like those are our fours. 
this rotating through. And Malik had proved, no, I got the spot. Like, I'm holding it down. So we're like, okay, cool. We got our four man now. Now it's time to hoop. And, um, yeah, no, it was devastating. It was devastating. I remember we were in the kitchen, um, you know, obviously right upstairs, right by DT's uh, old office yep. right there. We were in the kitchen, and the guys are like, so X, now what? And they're looking at me like, you know, you have a decision to make. And I was like, no, I do have a decision to make. And then literally as we were like talking about it, um, coach came in right in and I was like, yeah, can I talk to you? And like literally right then and there, he had asked me like, so, you know, what are you going to do? And I was like, well, I haven't put too much thought into it, but I at least want to test the waters. Like, I don't want to just jump out there if I'm not going to get drafted. Like, I want to make nice. sure that I'm going to get drafted before I say I'm going to leave. And he's like, okay. I will, I'm going to work with you through this process. I'm going to help you find an agent and we're going to get through it. And I said, thank you. I appreciate it. And he, he was great. The whole, uh, the whole pre-draft process for me. And, and he usually is, man. Like guys who go to the league, like, or want to test the waters. He's always, he's, he's always told guys like, I'm going to help you because I want you to be successful. Whatever you do in your life, I will make phone calls. I'm going to make sure you go through this process the right way. Mm-hmm. Um, and, 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 it, and you got there, man. And, you were drafted 35th overall in the second round by the Sacramento Kings, and you were later traded to Memphis. And in my opinion, man, you were easily a first round pick in my opinion. And I immediately thought of when Draymond, again, that connection between the two of you, I immediately thought of when Draymond was picked in the second round when he should have been a first round pick. The first thing that came to my ex was, all right, he basically, what's up, little buddy? He said hi. Bud? He <laughs> said hi. For those of you listening on Spotify, Bubba? Odyssey, or Tom and Apple, Bubba? X's kids are in the shot. So, but um, Bubba? so I always thought that Bubba? you know, all right, that chip on the shoulder is now there for X, and it showed, man. You had a really good rookie season. You a lot. And this is the one. This is my last question for you, and we'll get to the rapid fire questions. The play-in game. Who was the one to hit that go-ahead shot? Against Golden State and our boy Draymond Green to advance to the net to advance to the playoffs. It was you. It was you. I went nuts on my couch and I was like, man, at the same time, I'm happy for X, but Day Day's my guy. And I'm like, uh, I'm happy for X. I love Day Day. I'm I'm like a, I'm gonna let X win this one. <laughs> so Day got three, he got three rings. You gotta let me have one. Exactly, so right? Try. <laughs> So after the game, I saw you guys embrace. What did he tell you after that game? Uh, he told me, like, this is just the beginning for you and and to make them remember my name. And that was uh, huge because, you know, it, it, it's Draymond. Obviously, he's like a big brother to me. But at the same time, he has this stature and this reputation in the NBA as being the guy, like, like just like myself, you know, that utility that guy who can do it all, who can handle it, facilitate run the offense, set screens, get the best best shooters open and, and be able to make plays like that. He was the guy that I was mimicking, you know, who I had been mimicking since I got to Michigan State. So I was like, okay, for him to like officially at the biggest stage, give me like the go ahead, like, yeah, no, you got to keep going. Like, I see it. You're, you're, you're in the right spot. You're doing the right things. You got to keep going. It was huge for me because it was like, okay, bet. No matter how this, the rest of this year ends up, now I know, I have this confidence behind my back going into my second year that if I train the way I'm supposed to and work my butt off day in and day out, my second year will be even better than my first year. And, and, and that was motivation in itself. And I can guarantee it, man, in the couple of years that I've known you and the conversations we have had and the conversation we've had tonight, you keep that confidence up. You keep doing what you're doing. People will remember the name Xavier Tillman senior guarantee that man, you are, you are well on your way to a really, not just a fine career, man, but a great career. And I'm super excited to see, you know, what the future holds for you. I appreciate that. Yeah. No problem, man. All right. Ready to have some fun here? Come on. Talk to me. All right. So we have 10 rapid fire questions here. These are goofy, funny, however you want to portray them. I like to call my first question, question number one, the master's question, because it is a tradition unlike any other. So question number one, strawberry or grape jelly? Strawberry. Question number two, your favorite NBA arena you've played in? Um, wow, that's a good one. I would say, 
I would say either uh, ours, the FedEx Forum, or Miami. Okay. When we went to when we went to Miami, that was that was pretty cool too. Okay, okay. Question number three: Your least favorite jersey you wore at Michigan State. Your least favorite jersey you wore at Michigan State. The Mac, the the agricultural, the Michigan agriculture, the the nineteen twenties look. <laughs> oh my god, I hated it because I had not known the history behind it. So I'm like, what the hell is Mac? Like, <laughs> what is that? And I always like, I I did not like those jerseys. Yeah, that's that's the least known fact that a lot of people know about our the, our alma mater, man. It was initially known as Michigan Agricultural College. And when you guys like they wore them in 1999, but then when you guys wore them, I was like, how many, how many folks, you know, maybe are like historic alumni probably know, but I'm like, how many people in our fan base really know what Mac stands for? Right. <laughs> oh man. But me personally, like, and I and you may have a different opinion on this. I'm not a I'm not a big fan of the neon green. I'm not. Oh, you're talking about Costi and, and Denzel's neon green that they had? Yeah, I was not a big. I, so the the one the one you guys have where it's all black and the neon lettering, like I love that. But when mm-hmm. when Zell and Costello and those guys wore the neon green, that was bright neon. I was I like, remember that. ooh. I it was, was a phase though. It was a phase because it was. I remember everybody, even in the pros, they all had that. Like everything was the same color, and it was like, yeah. but okay, I guess that's the wave right now. But I don't know why ours was just neon. Like it should have been like our Michigan State green. Yeah, like Pr- Pr- that was our reunion day um, when they wore those old neons and Pruder gave us neon t-shirts. And I'm like, like Pruder, like, come on, man. Like, I can't wear this. Like, I look like a highlighter wearing this. He was like, oh, just wear it. I'm like, oh, geez. Anyway, <laughs> question number four, Madden or NBA 2K? 2K. Okay, just making sure. Question five, best motivational speaker not named Anthony Iani. Eric, uh, E.T., the hip-hop preacher. Eric, it's a very, very good yeah. choice. Very good. Question number six, your favorite pregame meal? Spaghetti. Spaghetti, or, or they call it in the um, in the league, turkey, or I guess spaghetti with uh, turkey bolognese. It's like just meat in the sauce. Okay, okay. But, nice. but uh, for some reason, you know, you're on the road the whole time, and and you just you get sick of eating salmon or, or steak or something right, like that. Yeah. So it's like that home, like just a warm spaghetti just gives me like home cooked vibes. I hear you. Plus you gotta change it up a little bit too, right? Mm-hmm, absolutely. Question number seven: Name a Disney movie that you've watched more than three times with your kids. Well, I got a couple for you. I, I just do easy. I'll just say Moana. I'll say Moana, but I got a lot. <laughs> Mo- Moana and Frozen are my two, you know, with my Moana, kid. Frozen, Coco. Have you ever seen Coco? Yes, I have. Very good movie. And recently, um, it was um, oh, what's it called? Oh, the movie about the about the sea monster that turned into a human. Luca. 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 Yes. We we I swear we watched that movie ten times in one day because my youngest loved it so much. Ten times. I actually oh. haven't sat through it the whole time yet because. We, so you I, need to. You know, I got a couple of dollars now, so my, my kids have iPads, so they um, go. they watch it on their own iPads. So I don't have to, you know, sit down and put it on the big screen. You you should watch the whole movie, watch through the whole thing, man. I actually enjoyed it, but after the third time, I'm like, okay, like can we watch something else now? Like, come on. Right. Disney has Disney Plus. If you're a parent out there and you're listening, and your kid is coming up and you want to be entertained by things they watch, you need to get Disney Plus. Disney Plus. Amen. This has an array of movies. I mean, you just can get lost in the amount of movies that they have that you'll be entertained by and they'll mm-hmm. be entertained by. It'll be for two totally different reasons because they'll have adult jokes in it that the kids don't get. And then they have like fun stuff for the kids to get. But Disney exactly. And, and they get to watch movies that I grew up on, like the Mighty Ducks, like the Disney Channel original movies, like all those. Like I, I, I'm i doubling that Disney Channel Plus. Shout out to them. You are true mm-hmm. game. Question number sure. eight, if you could teach a class, what would the subject be? Math. Ah, I'm a big, I'm a big numbers guy. I love numbers. Numbers just make sense. Theories, theories do not make sense to me. They're made up. <laughs> but numbers, numbers make sense. Two plus two equals four. Yes, there's no, there's nothing else that can equal. It's four. 
So uh, I'm a huge math guy. I love it, man. All right, question number nine. You're probably going to roll your eyes at me on this one. Michael, Kobe, or LeBron? LeBron. Okay. We we could have an argument over this another time, but we had we, – we have had so many serious dialogues. When you just said that, I just thought back to all the Instagram slide-ups that I had on your page. Like, bro, chill. You know LeBron is better. But, like, you had the benefit, though. Like, you got the least. Did you see Mike play a little bit or not really? No, I, I, I watched Mike play every time he was on TV. And that's my thing. I hadn't seen a game of Mike. So I'm like, bro, I don't know. Like, you can watch the highlights. And I'm like, okay, he's good. I'm like, doubt him. And the stats are pretty good. But LeBron is literally like, I think he's top three in scoring. He's gonna mm-hmm. finish top, he's gonna finish top 10 in three categories. Mike was just scoring. And it's it's funny you bring that up because every time I had this conversation with my dad, who's the greatest, he'll either refer to Bill Russell or Will mm. Chang. Because my dad, as it, he was born in 53, my dad as a younger kid grew up watching those guys. And he remember how Wilt, I mean, Wilt's career stats are 30 and 23, which is ridiculous. And my dad has always said to me, like, those two will always be the greatest to me. And I'm like, you know what? It's kind of like that with today. Like, my generation will always say Michael's the greatest because, you know, we watched him. Like, whereas mm-hmm. today's generation, your generation has been on LeBron from day one, watching it from day one. So mm-hmm. in the next generation may say, oh, well, Giannis is the greatest of all time. And it's like, no, here we go with the GOAT arguments again. It's oh, like, my God. Hey, go again. <laughs> let's, let's, let's give Giannis his flowers. He just had 40 back-to-back games in the NBA Finals. And, they got a, and he got his first NBA Finals win. Let's give him his flowers for sure. But I would take it <laughs> so personal if somebody says, yes, Giannis is the best. LeBron. LeBron, um, he he lost to Phoenix 4-1 or something like that. Like, why are we saying LeBron's the GOAT? I completely understand where they're coming from. But if they saw the Heatles LeBron, him, Chris Bosh, and D-Wade, mm-hmm. they would understand. Like, I was oh, in yeah. that era. I was in that era like, this team is amazing. That's why I love playing team ball because I'm like, yep. they have three superstars. They're unbeatable. Right. And so that was my thing. No, I hear you, man. No, I remember watching those Heat teams. That was my, my senior going to my senior year in Michigan State, like the, the summer days of just watching those teams after workouts, like those are the best. All right, last question for you Who do you admire the most? Um, my wife, I admire my wife because what she does on the day in and day, day in and day out basis is not easy, but she doesn't complain, like she just gets the job done and and. I don't know, like her mentality is kind of like my parents that I mentioned at the very beginning of this interview, just the way she conducts herself, like as far as being responsible, being accountable, being the definition of a great parent. Um, it's something that I marvel at on a day in and day out basis, especially when I'm on the road, because when I'm on the road, we FaceTime, you know, uh, in the morning when the kids, when the kids wake up and, you know, before they go to sleep. And then, you know, I talk to my wife after the day's over and stuff like that, but she literally gets it done by herself when I'm on the road. And then when we're together, she even gets the majority of it done. So I, I tip my hat to her for sure, just because she really, she holds it down. I love it, man. I love it. Just beautiful. All right. Last thing I'm going to have you do. I do this with all my guests and I want you to do it. So give us and the listeners your positive message for the week. Your positive message of the week for the listeners. You, my friend, the floor is yours. Take it away. It's It sounds so simple. And the reason that I'm going to say this is because today I just had this, like, I guess this feeling washing over me that I needed to watch YouTube videos on how to be kind. And I don't know why. Like, I, might, I haven't been feeling or acting like a jerk, but I have been in a negative state of mind for the last couple of days. And I remember I would listen on my way to the gym, I was listening to like three or four different, you know, 10, 15 minute videos. And the biggest thing that got out of all of them was be kind and treat people with, with respect. And if you need help, ask for help. Because a lot of the times people feel like they're alone in this world and they don't feel like they have anybody to ask for help. So they don't ask for help. When in return, the people who love you feel like, oh, you know what, you know, they always act like they got it, so I'm not going to reach my hand out and help. But in return, or if they ask for help, if they say, hey, man, I'm really struggling, your circle, your people who love you, your mom, your dad, your best friends, 
your, your siblings, they're going to quickly pick you up, wrap their arms around you and pick you back up. So being kind and, and asking for help is the biggest thing uh, that I learned today. And, and I'm going to run with it too, especially because, you know, for me, being the man in the house, like, I feel like you're not supposed to ask for help. You're supposed to know it all. But realistically, I'm 22 years old. You know, 22 years old with, with two children, good job. Two children, um, a dog and a wife. Like, I, I do not know everything, but I'm learning day in and day out. And I'm willing to take advice from just about every situation. So um, that's my biggest thing. Be kind and, and, and ask for help when it's needed. Ladies and gentlemen, he is former Michigan State basketball great, current Memphis Grizzly, and one of the most humble individuals that I know in my life. He is Xavier Tillman Sr. X, my man, thank you so much for coming on. It was great to see you. Please give the wife and your two kids my very best and thank them as well for giving, giving uh, having them uh, give you us for about an hour here. So please know, thank right? you for, for letting us have you for a little bit. I got you. I'm about to go throw down on this food that I made. So I appreciate it, fellas. <laughs> I'm about to go play uh, Papa Shot here in a minute in my uh, kid's toy room and just goof around. So but hey, man, you already know anything you ever need, anything I can ever do for you and your family, you know, I'm a phone call or text away. All right. Gotcha. I appreciate it. Anytime, man. Talk to you later. Yeah. I want to thank Xavier Tillman Sr. for coming on again. Just, just an awesome conversation he and I had today. And I, I can't be more proud of him and super blessed to know him and call him a friend in my life. Just an incredible individual. And like I said, in my opinion, one of the most humble individuals that you'll ever meet. And just everything he has in life, from his wife to his two kids to an incredible career ahead of him in the NBA, he's got it all. And he doesn't brag to anybody about it. And he's just very down to earth. And I cannot thank him again for coming on. It's been a pleasure and a joy to have him on here today. And again, I want to thank his wife and kids for allowing us to take the time to spend with him today. So thank you to his wife and his two kids for letting us spend time with him today. But for my positive message of the week, you know, Xavier kind of talked about being kind to everybody and not being afraid to ask for help when you need it. And I kind of want to talk about that a little bit. And it kind of reminded me of everything that we've been through during this pandemic. And I know we're not out of the woods yet. We still got still got a ways to go, but we're getting to a point where things are starting to get back to normal and people are now going about their normal lives again. But the one thing that I've learned from this pandemic is that life sometimes throws you a curveball. And that curveball was big for a lot of us. And it was a big swing and miss, if you will, in baseball terms. And the one thing I saw was a lot of people struggling mentally. A lot of people not knowing what to do. And the one thing that I tell students all the time is, is I don't care how old you are. I don't care if you're a kindergartner, a first grader, or if you're a senior in high school, a senior in college, you're an NBA all-star player, you are, you own one of the biggest corporations in the world, you own Amazon, I don't care. Do not be afraid to ask people for help. And you can go to anybody you want to. You go to mom, dad, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, cousins, grandparents, your best friend's family. It doesn't matter who it is. Please just know that if you are ever in trouble in life, if you have a lot going on, if, you're stre if your stress is through the roof, if your anxiety is through the roof, number one, take the time to be not only, not, well, let me rewind for a little bit. Take the time for yourself. You need to take time away from work get away from work. You need to just go out for a walk for an hour, work out, just be a place where you can be, you know, alone, your happy place, go for it. Take some time for yourself if you need it. But also know too, if you ever need to talk to anybody, if you ever need help from anybody, it's okay to ask for it. It doesn't mean you're weak. What it actually means is the opposite. It means you're strong. You're a strong individual to ask for help. And that's why like I've been taught my whole life, that if you need help with something, ask somebody. If you need advice, guidance, ask somebody. I'm 32 years old, 32. Happily married for over eight years. Shout out to my wife, Kelly. Two beautiful, handsome boys in Knox and Nash. I'm a parent of two kids. Got a motiv I'm a motivational speaker, got a career ahead of me. I travel all over the country, all over the world. But guess what? If I'm ever caught in a tough spot, if I got a big decision coming up, I'm not afraid to go to my mom or my dad. At 32 years old, look them in the eye and say, hey, mom, dad. If you were in my shoes right now, what would you do? 
or if I'm struggling, mindset, mentally, I'm not afraid to ask for help because I know that people out there in the world today, I'm not alone. It's like that with the autism community. I'm not alone. There's over 3.5 million people, of, excuse me, over 3.5 million of us in the country with autism. So I'm not alone. I know there's others like me out there. And it's the same for all of us. We're all alike in some way. We may be different, but we're all alike in some way, some shape and form. So don't ever forget. Take time for yourself and just know that it's okay to ask for help because you are not alone. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We will see you on the next episode where we will have Dan Miller on. Dan Miller is part of Fox 2 News Sports here in Detroit. He is the play-by-play commentator for the Detroit Lions. We're going to have a great conversation with Dan. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Peace and love. Thank you. Anytime you're shortcutting it, you're probably cheating some people. Players play. Tough players win.